Ted, do you want to go ahead and uh, introduce John? Yeah, so uh, this is going to be great for, I think, everybody, even if you if you are uh, keen on photography, um, we've got John Vaith, our, our, um, one of our own members, who uh, was a professional photographer for Kodak for a number of years and traveled around the country uh, teaching classes uh, to different places and also did um, uh, walking tours and so forth in the national parks in the summer for photography. So uh, he's got a lot of experience and then coupled with that, he's a wood turner. So, you know, not only does he know photography, but he knows wood turning and you combine those two things and he's the perfect guy for to help us uh, get better photographs and not take a half a day or a whole day to do it like, like Jim does. <laughs> uh, so hopefully we'll learn some some tricks and so forth on how to uh, get yourself set up. Uh, no matter what kind of equipment you have, John's going to talk about some basic setup or more advanced setup and how you do that and so forth. And then really how to take some shots so that uh, you impress people a little bit more, at least with your work, hopefully a lot more uh, with your work going forward uh, so that um, people will appreciate all your hard work. So with that, I'll turn it over to John and uh, he can get started. Thanks, Ted. Uh, Steve, I assume I can still share my screen. We should be ready to go. Yep, we should be ready to go. All right. Uh, there we go. Okay, hopefully everybody, whoops. There we go. Okay, hopefully everybody has a screen that says photographing wood turnings. And uh, I am going to first just uh, kind of outline what the presentation is going to be. Uh, as far as an introduction, Ted already mentioned that I used to be a photographer for Kodak. Um, I worked in a studio in a research and development area as a studio photographer. And then I also spent a lot of time in a marketing arm of the organization um, out in the field doing, uh, as uh, Ted mentioned, doing seminars on 35 millimeter photography and also one of the best jobs ever invented. I got to work in the national parks all summer long. Um, conducting photo walks and workshops and so forth, helping people get good pictures while they're visiting the national parks. Um, dirty work, but somebody had to do it. So <laughs> I, I love that. Um, as far as taking pictures of uh, your wood turnings, we'll uh, review equipment required for a simple setup and also a more um, uh, dedicated setup. I'll talk about terms that, uh, and, and feel free to stop me if I throw out a term that you haven't heard before um, and make sure that everybody's on the same page. And then I'm gonna show you my approach. I just have a little seven minute video uh, that I created and um, it'll kind of go over the basics and, and just give a visual demonstration of how I set things up. Um, and then I'm going to spend a fair amount of time going through results, uh, different pictures, what I look for, what I like about it, what I don't like about it, what I would do differently. And uh, so you kind of get a sense of how I uh, view the results. And uh, though Jim said sometimes he'll spend a half a day uh, taking uh, a picture of one of his wood turnings. Um, I don't, uh, I, I can spend a lot of time sometimes, they're uh, tricky uh, subjects and I'll talk about some of those. Um, finally, finishing touches on the computer with photo processing software and uh, some advanced settings for those of you who have more sophisticated cameras, I'll, I'll just briefly touch on those. And then at the very end, I have a list of suppliers and resources. So all the equipment that I use, um, you don't have to um, ask during the presentation, uh, what am I using or where do I get it? Because it's all in the list at the end. And I know Ted said that he could post that on the uh, 
website or post the presentation on the website and you'll have access to those. Okay, uh, importance of good photographs uh, is pretty self-explanatory for me anyway, you know, especially when I first got it started, started in wood turning, I would spend hours and hours and hours to try to create a simple bowl. And uh, I wanted to have a record of that. So I started taking pictures of it and I have a picture of virtually everything I've made since I started wood turning. Um, if you are selling your work, if you have good photographs, it's gonna make your work more saleable. It certainly enhances the look of your website if you have one, and it increases the likelihood of you getting into a juried uh, craft fair. Uh, good photographs, uh, there's no substitute for good photographs because that's how you get into those craft fairs. Uh, uh, there's also a really good video on the AAW Voices series on um, photographing uh, wood turning. Uh, and you might want to take a quick look at that. And there's a link in there. Hey, John, could yeah. you just stop with? So if, if I'm monitoring the chat, so if anybody has questions as we go through this, um, just just type them into the chat and I will uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get them addressed. Um, um, as we go along here, but I, I am monitoring the chat. Okay, thanks, Steve. Yeah, because I don't see anything other than my screen right now. Okay, as far as basic equipment requirements, you can do this with just about any camera, um, a simple background, a light source, and a reflector. That really it, um, works out quite well for a large percentage of um, uh, wood turning pictures. If you want to get a little more sophisticated and have a little more repeatability in your results, then uh, you can have more advanced equipment. So a, a digital single lens reflex camera, a soft box, remote flash, commercial reflector, graduated background, light stand, tripod. I mean, and the investment is not insignificant by the time you add all those up, but uh, I know I'm, I find that a lot of wood turners are also photographers by nature. They like the creativity of photography and a lot of them are already pretty experienced and have pretty decent cameras. So if you do, and if you want to um, have more repeatable and more advanced results, then uh, take advantage of uh, some of the equipment that you own. Um, I'm gonna start a video demonstration. It's just a, a seven minute video and uh, uh, just hold your questions until after the video and then we'll get into the slides and examples. So photographing your wood turnings is critically important, especially if you are trying to sell your, uh, your creations. Uh, if you're creating a website and you wanna have the highest quality images available, you need to know how to photograph them properly. Um, also, if you are uh, entering into craft fairs, usually they require you have send some samples, uh, sample images, and you'll have a much better chance of getting in the craft fair if you have high quality images than if you don't. The biggest mistake I see people make when they are photographing their wood turnings is the light. They have light bouncing all around the room and it's not creating the shape and the definition that you're looking for. Two things to remember in photographing your wood turnings. One is the quality of light, and two is the direction of light. It's really that simple. So I have my uh, setup in the garage right now. I use a graduated background, which is really important to have a nice background that's not distracting and that creates some uh, dimension and separation between your wood turning and the background itself. Uh, so I like a graduated background that goes from white on one end up to black on the other end. Um, the light source in this case, let me show you the simplest way to do this. If you don't want to invest a lot in your setup, find a room or use the garage where you have the light source coming from one direction and one direction only. Now in my garage, I've got two big windows and they add a lot of ambient light, which I don't want. So I put black plastic over those windows. My light source 
in this case is just the big overhead garage door. And it's coming from about a 90 degree angle to the wood turning. So I could take a picture right now. With a simple camera, wood turning. And if the shadow side is getting a little bit too dark, then all I need to do is bounce a little bit back in using a reflector. And a reflector can be anything. It could be a, white, a piece of white cardboard. It could be a, a pillowcase. I personally like a fairly rigid reflector. This happens to be one made by a company called Lastolite. And it's got a silvery surface on one side and that is a great way to control how much light is on the shadow side of your of your product Now, that is probably the simplest and least expensive way to get a reasonably good image, a reasonably good quality image for your wood turnings. I prefer a more dedicated setup so that it's repeatable. Obviously, if I'm uh, relying on daylight for the image, the time of day is gonna make a difference and how much sunlight is in the area is gonna make a difference. So I prefer to have something that is repeatable and a little more dedicated. And I'll show you what I like to use. It's a soft box. This is the soft box and it happens to be just mounted on a simple light stand. Soft box is exactly that. It's a box, This, in this case about two feet square and it has a couple of baffles in here. This is just a piece of nylon in the front. If I peel it away, you'll see another piece of nylon in the middle. Those two pieces of nylon will soften the quality of light coming through the softbox. I could use a bright light uh, from Home Depot on the back of the softbox that, that gets softened by that nylon or my preference is to use a remote flash unit that actually gets triggered wirelessly by the camera. So let me illustrate that. I'm going to move the softbox over here. It's about a 90 degree angle to my wood turning. And I'm gonna close the garage door. Okay, so I've closed the garage door and it's nice and dark in here. And really the only light that's illuminating my subject is coming from that softbox. And I've got the reflector bouncing a little bit of light back into the shadow side of the subject. So let me go ahead and take that picture. Maybe I'll move the reflector a little bit and try one more. And there we go. After I take a, cup, a few pictures, what I'll do is I'll look at them. A lot of times I'll load them up onto my computer and take a look at them. Turn the light back on so you can see me. And depending on the results, I may make some adjustments. Sometimes I raise the uh, softbox up higher. Sometimes I move it around a little bit closer to the camera. Sometimes I move it further away from the camera especially if you have a subject that has some translucency to it and you want light coming through it, it's good to have the softbox back further so it's, uh, the light is coming from behind the subject. Um, but depending on what you're trying to create, if your subject has texture and you want to illustrate that texture, well, you want that light skimming across your subject. You don't want it directly in front. You want it skimming across. 
So lots of opportunities. I will usually take multiple shots of my subject to see what gives me the effect that I most want uh, to demonstrate. Okay. Um, any questions on the video before we head into the slides? <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, okay. how do you frame yourself rectangularly like that? How do I? Uh, what do you mean? The images? You took yourself standing there. Oh, you're yeah. Not, you're not a square picture. You framed yourself rectangularly. Um, that's not it, a setting on the camera or something. No, no. It was just a, an iPhone video. Uh, oh, taken, okay. taken with an iPhone. <laughs> the other thing is with a light box, you need two of them, one on each side or? No, no. And I think that's a mistake a lot of people uh, make is they try to do it with two lights and they end up with multiple shadows. They end up with a very flat image as opposed to an image with good um, lighting ratio. And I'll explain that as I go along okay. here. But this, this picture right here, uh, which is kind of a view from above, shows how simple the setup is. And I start virtually every picture with this arrangement. And then I make modifications as I go along. So I got the backdrop, backdrop I've got the subject, I've got the, the, the light source is about a 90 degree angle to the subject compared with the camera. And then the reflector is on the other side, which I call the shadow side of the subject. So Does the reflector need to be 180 degrees from the light source? No. It, do, it does not. It really depends on where you want that light to be reflected. And I'll show some examples of that sometimes you just want a little bit of light reflected toward the, the back or the, uh, the far right side of the subject. Sometimes you want the light reflected more to the front, in which case I would move the reflector around closer to the camera. A uh, question? Yes. Uh, if you're us using a soft box without the uh, remote, remote uh, flash, uh -huh. um, for shooting this type of subjects, what kind of what? If you're going to just use a, a fixed bulb, what color would you what, what color would you choose for that bulb? Well, here's what I would suggest, and that's a great segue into uh, kind of the next uh, set of slides. Okay, just, um, just go, if you're going to cover it later, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, yes, it will be covered in uh, one or two more slides. But the <laughs> what type of light should I use? I think the simplest is window light. Um, you know, for centuries, the great artists of the world, all they had, they didn't have electric lights, of course, so all they had was uh, natural light to uh, illuminate their subjects. And the great portrait artists would look for a window. They would build their studio so that it had a window that faced north. And the reason they wanted a window that faced north if, um, is so that it would never be direct sunlight coming in that window. It's only skylight that's coming in into the window. And that is really the, that's kind of the ultimate quality of light that we're looking for. A nice, soft light source that's not real specular in nature, not real harsh, doesn't create real hard shadows. Um, so that's, you know, if you have a window in your room, in your home, that kind of fits that criteria. It doesn't have to face north, but that, that makes things a little bit easier. Um, but the key is you want that light coming from one direction only. So if you have multiple windows in the room, cover the other ones with black plastic. Uh, you just want light coming from one direction. Um, when you're using window light, there's really no need for a light modifier like a softbox or, uh, or a, a photographic umbrella um, because that light is already soft enough. And as the last bullet here, I can't emphasize enough. You don't want direct sunlight on your subject ever. 
Um, so the next alternative besides window light is an artificial light that uh, photographers refer to as hot lights. And the reason they're called hot lights is in the old days, um, they were just super high wattage incandescent bulbs, which were very hot. <laughs> and and uh, But now you can get LED versions that are not hot and serve the purpose quite well. Uh, there's a couple of camera stores in the Raleigh area, uh, Raleigh and, and Chapel Hill area that I I would highly recommend. One is Peace Camera and the other is Southeast Camera. And they sell all kinds of, of hot lights and de depending on what direction you decide to go, whether you're gonna use a softbox or an umbrella or whatever, they can match up a appropriate hot light that's gonna work with it. And, uh, and then also the light, appropriate light stands to make it easy for you to handle. Um, the nice thing about hot lights is because they are a continuous light source, you can see the effect as you move the light around. And that's a huge advantage, especially as you're getting started in this. You know, for me, uh, <laughs> um, the flash is fine because I've done this a million times, but, um, sorry, my dog is wanting to leave the room here. Um, but, the, but for most people, a hot light is a great way to go because you can actually see the effect before you click the shutter. And it's generally uh, cheaper than electronic flash. Um, then the third alternative is a remote flash, as I suggested. Um, I, it's lightweight, it's uh, easy to use. There is a bit of a learning curve. You can attach it to the soft box. Um, you can find very powerful uh, remote flashes, um, <clears throat> and but as I said, they can be a little more complicated to use. They're certainly less bulky than hot lights. I'm sorry, was there a question? Okay. Um, and you can usually find good used options. I think Steve, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you found a, a used uh, flash unit at one of those stores. Is that right? Uh, that's right. Yeah, it was a three hundred dollar flash for seventy five dollars and, yeah. and 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 also i got the remote unit there as well so because my uh, camera, yeah my camera didn't have the didn't have the capability to do the remote so 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 if you do have a dslr camera a digital single lens reflex camera check your instruction manual and see if your camera has a commander mode um, it's generally the more advanced cameras that include the commander mode, but what that does is it enables the camera to trigger a remote flash without having to connect any wires or any other equipment. Um, and it's, it's kind of cool because the, uh, the flash on the camera itself adds nothing to the exposure. It doesn't, um, it, it only triggers that, uh, that remote flash. Um, and with some sophisticated DSLRs, the exposure can be um, automatic. So it's really easy to get a good exposure because it uses through the lens metering. Um, but this is by far the most expensive option. Um, <clears throat> but again, if you are serious about it and you want a good dedicated setup, that might be something worth considering. Now the light modifier is only needed if you are softening an artificial light. You don't need it if you're using window light. Um, but if you have a, either a hot light or a flash unit, they're very, very harsh and they can create very hard, dark black shadows, which don't generally don't look good for this type of photography. And a softbox <clears throat> or a photographic umbrella are both good options uh, to soften the light significantly. I prefer the softbox because it's a little bit more controllable. You can control the direction of it a little bit more easily. The umbrellas, as you see in these pictures, um, it's a photographic umbrella. They're not too expensive. A uh, uh, softbox is maybe a hundred bucks, $120, something like that. Uh, <clears throat> the umbrellas are maybe 30 bucks for uh, uh, a photographic umbrella. 
And they work great. They're ideal for taking portraits of people, uh, portrait photographers, fashion photographers. That's about all they use is um, umbrellas, or they use them a lot, I should say. And then finally, you need a reflector. <clears throat> and a reflector can be anything that reflects light without changing its color. So a large white card or, or a piece of gator board, you know, the, the stiff uh, foam core board you can pick up at Jerry's Artorama. Um, get something that's at least two feet square. Uh, then there are commercial reflectors like the one I showed in the video. Uh, Lastolite is a great company that makes really nice reflectors. And that helps you control the amount of light on the shadow side of the subject. And it helps create the ideal lighting ratio, which I will describe in just a minute. Um, use the reflector on the opposite side from where the light is coming from, generally. But as uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, somebody asked before, you can move that reflector around, move it closer to the camera, farther away from the camera, just depending on what you're trying to uh, fill in in the picture. Okay, lighting ratio is the amount of light on the highlight side of your subject compared with the amount on the shadow side of the subject. Um, portrait photographers learn this, that's kind of lesson number one is to create a, a good lighting ratio for shooting portraits and uh, they have sophisticated meters that can help measure how much light is on each side of the subject's face and so forth. You don't, <clears throat> excuse me, you don't need to know that. An ideal range is roughly four to one. Um, but again, it's not something you need to measure. You don't need to buy a light meter to, uh, to do that. I'll, I'll show you instead what to look for, um, which is good detail and definition on the highlight side, as well as good tail detail and definition on the shadow side. <clears throat> a good lighting ratio will give you shape and a 3D quality to your images. If the shadow side is too dark, just move the reflector in closer. And sometimes I have the reflector, I mean, so close that it's just barely out of the camera view. Um, or conversely, if the shadow side is uh, too light, Move the reflector further further away or don't use it at all. Okay, now me, let me show you some examples of all that rather than just uh, words on a slide. <clears throat> so let's start with uh, uh, some flat work because it's easier to illustrate um, lighting ratio with uh, a flat sided object like this box that I made a long time ago. <clears throat> if you look at the highlight side, which is this, that's where the light is coming from. In this case, the light would have been off to the right, probably about a 90 degree angle. And there's the highlight side. And then here's the shadow side. If you notice the detail in both of those, both the highlight and the shadow side, there's good detail. The highlights aren't washed out. They're not all blown out. And the shadows aren't all blocked in. Um, you know, there's good detail on both. And that's the type of lighting ratio you should be looking for. <clears throat> um, I used to build a lot of furniture. Obviously, I couldn't put it on a, uh, a graduated background. So uh, in this case, I took the table and just stuck it in the front hall and opened up the front door a few inches to let some light in. And it's again about a 90 degree angle. So it creates that definition that I'm looking for. I wanted these drawers, the profile of these drawers to stand out. Notice the shadow side over here of the drawer. Same thing on the other drawers. <coughs> and, excuse me, and then I have the shelf uh, down below. So you can create it, you know, with window light, you just have to be careful uh, what the direction of the, uh, light is. Um, here again, the lighting emphasizes the drawer relief as well as the curly maple top. And just a couple other examples of uh, light coming from the side, providing good highlights. And on the shadow side, which would be over here, now this is probably even more than a four to one lighting ratio because these shadows are getting a little blocked up, but I like the drama of that picture. I like it on the dark background and the Coca Bolo really stands out. 
another one where, with a more extreme lighting ratio on a box that I made that uh, <clears throat> really what I wanted to focus on was the, the doors and the shoji screens that, uh, that were kind of the highlight of the piece. And it didn't matter that the shadow side was getting uh, quite dark. But when I talk about lighting ratio, that's what I mean. The amount of light on the highlight side versus the amount of light on the shadows, the shadow side. Now let's get back to some round stuff. Um, hey, this, John, hey, John. Yeah. Um, do you need to stop and get a drink? Are you okay? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I probably should, but. Uh, you can you can take a quick break if you need to get yeah, something to drink. Bear with me for uh, two minutes while I yep. grab a drink. Thank you. Anybody else uh, make these wave bowls that uh, John's showing here? Yeah, I've made a few. Have you? Do you have a do you have a jig for that? Yeah, yeah, I do. In fact, I've improved on it, and then I use it for all kinds of things. Um, that could almost be a whole demo. But uh, by yeah. setting this thing, I can cut waves in a tube or a, like a spindle and, and uh, can actually do a Celtic knot and all kinds of things with it. Yeah. John has a jig for it, I saw as well. So, yeah, let's talk about that some more sometime, Jim. Oh. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that, guys. I, um, That's fine. I probably didn't sound too good having coughing in your ear all that time. No, I just uh, don't don't like to hear you choking. I know what it's like. <laughs> well, the reason I, I've told some of the guys already, but I'm actually in California right now. We drove cross country. We've driven 5,200 miles so far and uh, we wanted to see our kids and grandchildren, and we didn't want to be exposed to COVID on an airplane, so we decided to try another approach. <clears throat> but the good news is I got tested recently, and I'm still negative. Okay, um, this image is a good image to refer back to as you get into this because I think it's about the ideal lighting ratio, at least that I strive for, between the highlight side and the shadow side. It's, I want it about that dark and about that light, and I want good definition on both sides. Here's an example that and is- you also, I mean, you also, the shadow side and the light side flip on the inside of the bowl. So you get you get you know you get this nice contrast between yes them, yes that you can see the opposite thing going on the on the inside. That's a great point, Lars. Um, I, you know, the, your whole objective here with lighting ratio is to create the illusion of a third dimension. You're photographing a three-dimensional subject, and you're reproducing it in two dimensions. You know, of your screen or print or whatever. And if you can create the illusion of that third dimension, you're going to be successful. And that helps create that illusion, you know, having the shadows and the highlights um, to give it some shape. So here's an example. No, go ahead. John, this is Preston. Uh, one of the problems I have, I don't have a softbox, but I get a lot of bright spots or very bright spots or reflections, and it seems to take away from things. And is a softbox going to fix that? A softbox will help, and I'm going to show some images of uh, uh, wood turnings that have glossy finish on it. And glossy finishes are a little tricky, but um, I will get into that. If you are getting pictures like this, where the highlight is blown out, when I say blown out, I mean it's losing detail in the highlight. You, you really can't see the grain of the wood anymore because it's just too light. And then when I say a, a shadow is blocked up, if I look at the shadow over here, mm. um, you don't see any detail on it. You don't see any grain. All you see is darkness. Same thing with way down here. So that's not a well-balanced um, light setup right there. One way to fix it is to dial the exposure back just a little bit and um, bring the reflector up closer to the right side of the bowl. And so I did that. And you can see how that's vastly improved 
Now I see detail in the shadows. I actually see some detail up here too. Uh, the highlight is still a little bright for my taste, but it's not bad. I mean, that's, that's a perfectly usable image. I did not use this image though, because of it for another reason. To me, the key feature of this bowl is the very thin maple veneer wave that I incorporated into it. And that wave goes through uh, the bowl, so it's on the inside as well. And I wanted, to dem I wanted to illustrate that, so I raised the camera up. I always use my camera on a tripod, so I, it's easier to kind of control the, the uh, composition. But there I did raise the camera up. Now I can see the, uh, the wave on the inside as well as the wave on the outside. And that also had the side benefit of that highlight um, didn't become quite so noticeable. Any questions on that one? <clears throat> so when you're taking a picture, a great, well, or when you're evaluating others' pictures and you say, and you see something that you like, the first thing you should look at is the shadow. Where is the shadow? Where does the shadow fall? Um, it really helps you understand where the light was if you can see where the shadow is. And in this case, um, or I mean, in all cases, what you really want to do is aim to have only one shadow. And if you've got multiple lights on, or if you have multiple windows in the room, you're probably going to be throwing shadows all over the place. You're going to see more than one shadow, or the shadows are going to all disappear because the lights are canceling them out. Um, but I think this, that shadow helps me determine that I've got a decent lighting ratio from the highlight side to the shadow side. And, uh, and that's pretty good. Now this happens to be a glossy finish on the bowl and you'll notice that really bright highlight um, being reflected in the gloss and there's almost no way to get rid of that. What you can do is you can control where it is on the bowl by where you position the soft box or whatever light you're using. And, um, you know, if you have the ability, if you're using an artificial light, you have the ability to raise the light up higher, which I did in this case, which put that highlight up here rather than down here. And you can even see a reflection from the reflector, which fills in the shadow side. You can see that's, that's from the reflector, not from the softbox. This one is a softbox plus a reflector. I kind of like this particular um, lighting arrangement uh, for this subject. I actually push that softbox back further. It's not 90 degrees, it's probably more like 100 degrees away from the camera. So it highlights maybe the first third of that vase. And then the rest, the shadow side, it's the reflector that's creating the light in there. And you just, sometimes it requires some experimentation. You gotta take a few shots, moving the reflector in and out and uh, closer, further away to get the level of definition that you want on the shadow side. Here is another vase, but this time with window light um, plus the reflector. And, and the window is on the, uh, the other side, uh, this time coming from the right. You can see the highlight there from the window. And then the shadow side is the reflector that's um, adding a little bit of detail to the shadow side. I probably could have pulled that reflector a little further away. I, I think that's maybe a little brighter than it needs to be, but that's um, you know just personal taste. Uh, another one with window light. Uh, and, and so, I mean, the, the, the purpose of this illustration is to say that there's nothing wrong with using window light. In fact, when we use artificial lights, our objective is to make it look like window light. So, um, you know, if you have a window, 
and you can control the rest of the light in the room, by all means, give it a try. Also, John, just uh, to, to interject, I guess, on that is uh, to, to totally agree with you is that the good thing for someone like myself and I would imagine others is that you can actually see what it looks like before you take the photo, right? With a yes. window light, you know, with a flash, you got to do three or four or whatever to figure out, oh, did that work or not? Or I got to move this up or move it down. You can kind of put your get your angle with your camera set, you can get your lighting kind of set and your reflector and then take the shot. Uh, it seems to work for me, it works a whole lot better. No, you're absolutely right, Ted. And um, that's also true with the hot light because uh, you can see it, it's a continuous yeah. light source. So you can see what you're doing and it's kind of easier to uh, manage the, the reflector and the distance of the reflector because you can see it right there in front of yourself. Yep. Okay, uh, backgrounds. We talked about graduated backgrounds and I use them probably 80 to 90% of the time, but I also use other things for backgrounds. In this case, uh, it's a piece of black velvet. Uh, not felt, it's uh, black velvet. If you go to a fabric store, uh, get black velvet if you can, you know, a good sized chunk of it because it just really sucks up the light. I mean, it, it just make if you want a nice dark background uh, to accentuate something like the cocobolo and the marble wood in this, um, in this ornament, uh, I think a dark background helps set it off really well. This is on a graduated background, but I was up high. I had the camera up high. So I'm kind of shooting down on the uh, light part of the background, the, the white part of the background. And I find that quite boring. I don't find that very interesting at all. You know, I, I suppose I could have, uh, move the background around so it's more in the gray area than the white area. But um, I flip the background upside down and put the uh, walnut bowl on top of uh, the dark area. And I find uh, just personally that dark subjects often look better on a darker background than they do on a light background. Here's another example of a bowl. I really like the undulating rim on this bowl and I wanted to accent, accent it a little bit. And so by putting it up against a dark background, I think that helped accent it. Again, a glossy surface, you're always gonna get that bright, bright highlight on a glossy surface, but depending on where you position the light, it's either gonna be higher, lower, it could be further back. Um, you know, just find a spot where it l is not too distracting and too annoying. I think if you have bright colors on your uh, wood turnings, they really pop against a darker background, much more so than they would against a white background. <clears throat> these are, um, you know, when Michael Gibson came and taught us how to make these candles, um, I made a bunch of them and the one in the middle, I think is 24 inches high. And I think it looks terrific on the graduated background, you know, light in the front and then dark at the top. The other thing I like about this picture, which is kind of subtle and, and you may not uh, catch it, but the, the reflector, remember that in this case, the, the soft box is 90 degrees to the left and the reflector is on the right hand side and I had it tucked back a little bit further and it creates just this very thin ribbon of light on this side of the candle. And again, to me, that gives more of a three-dimensional three quality to it. And I think, that's, uh, I think that's attractive. It's very subtle, but I think it uh, helps make the picture. Uh, one of my Saturn bowls, on a white to gray background. And that picture's okay. I, I like the texture uh, of the rim, but I wanted to see what it would look like if I put it on a dark background, dark on the bottom and lighter on top. So I flipped the background upside down and, and there it is uh, in the other direction. Again, you know, it's a dark wood, it's a walnut. And I think the dark wood looks pretty good against the uh, dark background. Um, 
this is maple with some wood burning. And on a white background, I think it would lose a lot of its impact. I think it looks better on a dark background. The, the way your eye always works, um, you can prove it to yourself by just by taking any picture that you have and turning it upside down. Look, look away from it for a second and then turn your head back very suddenly and, and look at the image upside down and see where your eye is attracted to first. And it will almost always be attracted to the brightest part of the image. And if the brightest part of the image is the most interesting part of the, Im you know, the image, then that's good. Uh, if it's not, uh, then you know, try to reframe the picture or use a different background if you can. And uh, you know, have the brighter part of the image, the more interesting part. Uh, okay, positioning the light, regardless of what type of light you're using, whether it's window light, hot light, or a flash. Um, this is the way I start virtually every one of my shoots. I'll start with the light at about 90 degrees to the left or to the right. And then I will position the light if it is a, a flash or a hot light, I'll position it at or slightly above the subject. And then I usually start with the light about three feet away and take a picture without any, uh, uh, without any reflector at all, take a picture and examine the, uh, the highlight side and the shadows. Once I see that first image, then I'll uh, make my adjustments. I'll move the light up or down. I'll move it farther or closer uh, to get better results. I'll, I'll take that reflector and I'll move it in close. I'll take the reflector and move it farther away. I will shoot, I would say on average, uh, 10 to 15 pictures um, before I finally get the, the one that uh, uh, reveals exactly what I want it to reveal. You don't always have to take that many, but um, it, it, it is amazing the subtle differences that can happen just by moving the light or the reflector uh, slightly. Um, if you have texture, I mentioned this in the video, but if you have texture on your subject, uh, it is accentuated by having the light skim the texture as opposed to if I put that light right by the camera, that, that texture would all be washed out. You really wouldn't see much texture at all by having it skim at a 90 degree angle, uh, you can see the depth of the texture. Same thing here, you get to see the depth of the carving uh, in this because the softbox is at a 90 degree angle. In this case, uh, I moved the softbox up higher and it's about a 45 degree angle. You can tell that by looking not only at the shadow over here, but also by the reflection of the softbox itself over here. Um, again, glossy surface, you're always gonna have that uh, bright specular highlight, but you get to choose where you want it positioned. I could have maybe minimized it by moving the light further away from the camera over on the left side and having the, uh, uh, the highlight over here instead. Um, but again, it's a matter of personal taste in the end. I usually, with glossy surfaces, I experiment quite a bit. Hey, John. Yeah. Yes. This is Steve. Um, do, you, do you worry about or take into consider, consideration the shape of the shadow? Uh, as you're doing this, or it is what it is? I mean, do, do you try to, I guess the question is, are, do you try to manipulate the shape of the shadow to try to give you the 3D effect? The shadow or the highlight? Um, the, the shadow, I mean, so on the far side, of the, on the dark side there, you know, uh -huh. does the shape of that, whatever that shadow, however it turns out, does that does that impact the, the three-dimensional look or uh, of it, you know. Um, right. 
Right. No, I, well, the short answer to your question is no. I don't try to control the shape of the shadow. I will try to control um, if the shadow is falling outside of the image frame, if it was extending way out here. Um, okay. I might not like that. And so I, in that case, I'll raise the flash up higher. So it's throwing the shadow down a little bit closer to the bowl. Um, but in, in terms of, you really can't do much to control the shape of the shadow. What I would advise though, is making sure you're avoiding multiple shadows. Okay. Okay. Yep. Uh, and speaking of Steve, here's one of his creations. When he came over to uh, my house, he brought these beautiful uh, burl pieces with the, uh, uh, transparent acrylic um, in them. And I thought that is just the perfect subject for highlighting from behind, lighting from behind. So the light is coming through that acrylic. And then the light on the front is actually coming from my reflector. So we moved the softbox quite a ways back. It was beyond 90 degrees, maybe 100, 110 degrees. Um, and it is shining through the back of this piece and through the acrylic, which makes it just come alive, I think. And the other thing I like about that lighting setup is it created this rim light right along the edge here. And again, to me, that just helps create that three-dimensional uh, quality that we're looking for. And your other edge is kind of dark, so it creates a, the frame around that as well. So that's, Yes, yes. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. But it's a beautiful piece, Steve, that yeah. I, uh, I enjoyed photographing. Can I explain <laughs> the shadow on that, please? Explain the shadow? <laughs> well, uh, my guess is we had the, the light, the softbox, higher than the subject itself. It wasn't at the subject level, it was probably a little bit higher. Steve, I don't know if you remember specifically, but I, I think it was probably a little bit higher. And then the uh, shadow is just being thrown. Um, it looks like 90 degrees, but it's actually probably not. Yeah, and I think the shadow is coming from the base. Yes. Uh, just because it is, because the light is high. And yeah. coming from but from the back, so um, I think the reflector kind of softened any other shadows that would have been there. We have another one of Steve's pieces coming up in a minute, and uh, the, I, I have a illustration of before and after the reflector. Uh, another Saturn bowl, ninety degrees uh, to the left, so you can see the texture of the carving on the on the rim. Um, when you have wood that has a lot of uh, uh, curls or you know something interesting in it, using that strong side lighting helps emphasize the curls. I mean, look from the highlight side right down into the shadows. You can see uh, those curls pretty dramatically. If I put the light near the camera, I think you'd wash all those curls out. Wouldn't look nearly as good. What lighting do you use to hide sanding scratches? <laughs> it's called Photoshop. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, if you go back to some my early pieces, Norm, I'm sure we can find lots of sanding scratches. Uh, this one drove me crazy. This was, you know, I, I had Al Sturt's video or his DVD, and I was uh, practicing his techniques and uh, with the carving and everything. And, and uh, then you, you burnish it after carving it. And when I photographed it, that burnishing just kept getting, you know, showing up as this, these bright reflections. And I didn't like that, uh, that I didn't particularly care for this result. And that was through the softbox, about a 30 degree angle uh, to the camera. I moved it around and I thought this was a, a vast improvement, although it still didn't, I still got a lot of kind of glossy uh, reflections over here, but
but I did like the, the texture that uh, it created by having the softbox a little further away from the camera. And I tried with the softbox high, I tried it with it low, I, I moved it back, I moved it forward and I couldn't get rid of all that glossiness. Finally, I just shut the, shut the flash off and I used window light only. And I think did a much, but it really got rid of the glossiness and still showed the texture of the piece. So again, personal preference, which one you like better, but um, it was the window light that finally gave me the result that I had hoped for. Uh, this is just a simple Bradford pear bowl that distorted after it dried, I, I turned it wet. Um, but I thought it was kind of an interesting distortion of the rim. And so I, I wondered what it would look like if I had the light directly overhead rather than at an angle to it. So I took the softbox off of its light stand and I held it overhead and uh, you know, it gave a different effect. You see the shadow go all the way around the bowl this time and it definitely puts a little more emphasis on the rim. But again, matter of personal taste, which one um, you like better. Uh, glossy finish, <clears throat> almost, you will almost always get it, uh, that bright specular highlight. I do like the softbox, one of the advantages of it is you get this kind of nice square um, specular highlight. Um, with an umbrella, you would get a round uh, specular highlight, wouldn't be quite as defined as it is in, in this picture. How about a, a window light then, John, would you get would it be square from the window still, or would it just be more like a star? No, it would be square like the window. Okay. <clears throat> um, you know, if it's a great big picture window, no, you're probably not going to get that uh, defined highlight. But or if your it's garage a, door type thing, I, yeah, know. garage door probably, you know, not. It's not going to be a defined highlight. Yeah. But if it was like a bedroom window, it would probably be. Um, you know, more look more like this. Uh -huh. Better than that, if you blow it up, you can see the neighbor's house. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, that one that I showed in the video, I don't know if you noted it with the, the last one taken with the iPhone. Uh, you could see our car, you could see uh, the trees, you know, outside in the in the reflection. And, uh, you know, sometimes that can be enhancing and sometimes it can be annoying. <laughs> um, another glossy surface, but this time I place the light high and the, the specular reflection is inside the bowl. If I had the light low, the specular reflection would be outside the bowl. John, what's the relationship? I mean, are, are, are you primarily shooting straight on? Or it looks like the camera's a little bit above the subject on this. I would say, yeah, 90% uh, of the time, I start with the camera slightly above subject, uh, the subject level. Uh, sometimes I raise it significantly above if there's something inside the bowl that I want to emphasize. I think I got an example or two coming up of that. But uh, yeah, I will generally start just slightly above the rim as far as where I uh, positioned my camera. Okay. And sometimes, you know, again, if you're trying to emphasize something down here, I'll lower the camera uh, to do that if there's nothing inside that I care about. Um, this one is, is okay. This is just a, a little box elder uh, platter that I made and it has its window light that is illuminating it. Or no, I take that back. It's a soft box that's illuminating it. But I happen to have the curtain in the room of the window open. I just wasn't paying attention. And you can see the, the uh, other shadow that was created. This shadow over here, that's from the window light. This shadow is from the soft box. It works okay in this picture. I don't think it's too distracting, but generally I avoid double shadows. I don't want 
one on each side of the subject. I just want one. Uh, okay, positioning the reflector, sometimes very close to the subject, just out of the camera view. Sometimes uh, it's closer to the camera. Sometimes it's further back. Sometimes it's several feet away or not used at all. I just try, I experiment. I, I try a number of them and find which one gives me the, uh, uh, the detail that I'm looking for. Um, the reflector can be tipped and tilted. There are times when I have it, uh, you know, very high, just kicking light back down into the bowl. Um, you know, you can, you can move that reflector anywhere as long as it's bouncing some of that light back into your subject. Uh, it'll probably give you an interesting effect. Here's one where uh, uh, Trent Bosch type style <laughs> um, hollow form uh, that I made after attending his class. And the reflector was a little too close and it flattened the facets. Uh, and if you see here, there's not a lot of definition in the facets over here. So by pulling the reflector a little further away, it kind of gave a little more shape and interest, I think, to the picture. Here's the other one of Steve's. Uh, again, the flash, about the same position as we used for the first one I showed you. It's, it's quite a ways back. It's illuminating the back of his subject and the lights coming through that acrylic. But I didn't use any reflector at all in this picture. So you can see it's quite dark in the burl over here without the reflector. Adding the reflector in, it's like you turned a light on, <laughs> you know, inside the thing. And uh, I think it's a vast improvement. So uh, relative to composition, with scenic photography, really a good composition usually uses the rule of thirds. And you've probably all heard that, um, that rule, which basically says if you divide an image frame into thirds vertically and horizontally, like a tic-tac-toe board, placing your subject or the, the most interesting uh, part of the subject at one of those four intersecting points gives you great balance in a picture. So that's really true with scenic photography and even portrait photography and so forth using that rule of thirds. With product photography, not so much. Generally, you want your product to be centered in the frame. Although I always leave a little extra room around the subject to do my final cropping on the computer. I always do that. So I have the camera backed up a little bit. I intentionally and shoot it a little bit wide. So then when I load it up into the computer, I can crop it down to just the shape that I want. And that's especially useful if you have a website um, because a lot of times you need a very specific size to fit a, uh, a, a portion of a page um, on your website. And then pay attention to the camera height, which we've already, already talked about. Uh, so I wanted to emphasize this bowl within a bowl effect on one of uh, my wave bowls. Um, and to do that, I raised the camera up a little bit above the level of the, of the rim. It's a little higher than the level of the rim. And then you can see that little indentation there, which kind of gives the il illustration of that bowl within a bowl. <clears throat> Um, if you have any interesting features or grain or something that you want to emphasize, um, make sure you position your camera so you can take advantage of that. So in this case, I raised the camera up fairly high uh, above the bowl and rotated the uh, bowl around so that looks like a piece of toast to me, but it, <laughs> um, that patch in the back gets emphasized. You don't always have to include the entire subject. You know, trust that uh, the viewer can complete the image, and they realize this is a platter, 
Um, so I didn't have to shoot the entire platter. Uh, the, in this case, I really wanted to emphasize the wood burning along the edge. And so I just moved in really close. And don't be afraid to move in really, really close. If you're playing with a Sorby texturing tool or something and you wanna show off that texturing, um, this is just a few inches away. Actually, I think I shot this with an iPhone. Same thing with this. That's kind of fun when you're playing with those uh, texturing tools. Um, and don't be afraid to use props occasionally. In, in advertising, the old maxim, don't sell the steak, sell the sizzle. Uh, you can create the sizzle by adding a prop as appropriate and uh, sometimes get an emotional response. And it also can help provide a sense of scale. So a couple of examples, here's uh, a bowl that I made. That I thought, well, that's really a perfect uh, size bowl for a full bag of popcorn. And so I added the popcorn in. Um, this is a big salad bowl. This is 14 inch salad bowl. And I added the spoon so that you got a sense that it was a large salad bowl. I mean, without the spoon, that could be a seven inch salad bowl. Uh, you wouldn't really have any way of knowing. So, and, and of course, unless I labeled it, <laughs> but uh, adding the spoon, I think helps give a, a sense of scale. Again, a couple more using props, just chips for a little simple chip bowl. Another one, a little nut bowl. You can get a sense that's a pretty small bowl made out of uh, hormigo and uh, added a few cashews in there. Now this is uh, not something that most of you will probably want to do, but it is kind of fun. Um, if you have a whether it's a hot light or a separate flash unit, you can also add a spot grid. That's what's sitting on top here. It's a little honeycomb shaped uh, grid. And what it does is it focuses the light. And it, it totally breaks my rule of aiming for soft diffused light. So you wanna use it sparingly. But what it does is it can create light that looks like very theatrical, uh, spotlight. Let me show you a couple of examples. Uh, this bowl you've seen before, but this time I just <clears throat> added that spot grid, held the light straight overhead and shot straight down on the bowl. And that created almost a, a gear like shadow down below, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, here's another one. This shows uh, the, the paint I liked, which was a milk paint and then a red acrylic on top of it. And I kind of liked the texture of the paint and everything. So I tried that spotlight from straight above to see how that would work. And it created that big round shadow uh, below. Um, so are you, uh, John, are you doing that in lieu of the softbox yes. or in addition to? No, that was in lieu of the softbox. And that's why I say use it sparingly because it's pretty harsh light, <laughs> you know, it's not that soft uh, light that you're usually looking for. Um, and that's why it creates the hard shadow, kind of a dark shadow down below, but um, it, it's fun to play with. It also created its own backlight from the bottom. Yes, it did. Yeah. And you have um, no reflector in that. No, no reflector in that at all. Nope, that's just the one light straight above. You know, I mean, this, this whole thing is really pretty simple. It's one light and it's occasionally a reflector, <laughs> you know, or, or I'd say probably 70% of the time a reflector. Uh, you don't have to have a lot more than that. Those are, uh, you can usually get exactly what you want with just those simple, um, simple things. Uh, again, this is the spot grid. I wanted to show off the texture of the, the boulder that he's pushing up the mountain and then the texture of the mountain itself. Uh, so I used that spot grid on it. This one I wanted to, uh, I, I didn't turn that glass bowl on the lathe, <laughs> but I wanted to show its uh, translucency. And I thought it really created a cool shadow when I held that spotlight 
very high and to the right, and then uh, shined it down onto the the bowl and created that uh, that cool shadow on this side. And same thing here, just a very irregular um, rim on it and I, that I wanted to emphasize. So tried the uh, spotlight for that purpose. Now, <clears throat> once you've shot these images and you wanna do something with them, um, I always do a little bit of post-processing on the computer. Uh, and, uh, and make a few adjustments. Uh, generally straight out of the camera, it's not exactly where you want it to be. And there are a lot of good photo processing um, options available now. I mean, if you own a Mac, uh, iPhotos has a, a very good uh, photo processing. Um, <clears throat> and there's a lot of free stuff on the internet. The one that I personally uh, prefer and use all the time is Adobe Lightroom. Adobe makes uh, Photoshop and they make Lightroom and Adobe Elements and they're all, I mean, Adobe, as far as I'm concerned, is still by far the, the best company in terms of image processing. And although there's a bit of a learning curve with Adobe, once you get used to it, it is, I would say 90% of my pictures have a few tweaks that were made in Adobe Lightroom. Maybe 2% of my pictures do I actually go to Adobe Photoshop and, uh, and make some adjustments. Um, but uh, again, Lightroom is just, it's a great tool. Um, Try to get the exposure right in the camera if you can, <laughs> and uh, and use the processing to just tweak the results. If you get really lousy exposure, if it's way overexposed or way underexposed, and then uh, you try to fix it in Lightroom, uh, a lot of times you'll fail just because uh, you know the the image information is not there uh, for you to uh, be able to make the right tweaks. Uh, but I do tweak almost all of my images. And I would say the first thing that gets tweaked is the exposure um, on the computer, usually up, down, up a little or down a little. And then I'll do my final cropping on the computer. Again, trying to crop it so that it fits my website. And then other controls that I often use in the uh, image processing our highlights, shadows, contrast, uh, clarity, and Lightroom has a feature called dehaze that I like a lot. Uh, white balance and spot removal. Sometimes you have your image sensor might have a little piece of dust on it and ends up a, a spot um, <clears throat> in the image and you need to remove it. So spot removal helps you do that. If you, uh, if you do own a DSLR, uh, single lens reflex camera, here's some, uh, th these are the things that I would recommend for you as a starting point. Use aperture priority mode. And I'm not gonna go into detail on these because uh, uh, many of you uh, will probably fall asleep <laughs> listening to the description, but aperture priority mode, uh, Set your aperture somewhere between f8, f11 for most images. Uh, use the EV dial on your camera to increase or decrease exposure to tweak it up and down a little bit. Set your ISO between uh, somewhere between 200 and 800. Use auto white balance. Um, the lens that you choose, if you have the ability to interchange lenses, uh, use a short to a medium telephoto focal length. So um, that'll depend on what type of DSLR you have. Um, but for my camera, that, that, you, that falls somewhere between 70 and 105 millimeters. For APS-C cameras, which is probably the bulk of DSLRs out there, uh, somewhere between 50 and 70 millimeters would be a good choice. 
And then to maximize depth of field, uh, focus on a point roughly one third of the bowl diameter from the front edge. So if you don't know what depth of field is, it's, it's just how sharp the image is from the front to the back. And um, to maximize that depth of field, uh, you've got to choose a point. You could focus on the front of the rim of the bowl, the very front of the rim, but then the back of the bowl might be uh, soft. It might be slightly out of focus. So if you focus about a third of the way in, it's going to maximize your depth of field. I would also suggest to take time to study word turning photographs and um, AAW and uh, the magazines, um, different websites, or you can go to my website and take a look of at uh, the pictures there. I continually add new ones. Um, and, you know, look at the lighting ratio, get accustomed to building that lighting ratio. So you have a difference between the highlight side and the shadow side. Uh, does the image convey depth? Does it exhibit the detail that you want? Is your eye drawn to any specific area? You know, by, by studying those pictures, it will give you some great insights as to where to position your light and, uh, and get the results that you want. I'm not gonna go through all these because I know Ted is gonna post them, um, but these are the suppliers, uh, you know, the, the exact equipment that I use, where you can get it. And um, so I won't go through all those in the interest of time, but uh, they're all available to you. Hey John, this is Ted. Uh, just a comment back on the uh, camera settings piece. So you had auto white balance on there and I found uh, um, that worked great for uh, window light. Mm -hmm. But when I used uh, hot light, the auto balance didn't work so well. It, um, it got too warm because the light was an incandescent bulb. Okay, it was an incandescent bulb. So, okay, yeah. that's a great point, Ted. And if you are gonna go the hot light route, uh, one suggestion I can make is if you went to one of those two stores, Peace Camera or Southeastern Camera, ask them for a hot light that's pretty close to daylight balanced. So it has a color temperature close to, uh, was it 5,200 degree Kelvin, which is uh, daylight and then you won't run into those issues. Incan just pure incandescent bulbs um, can be very, very yellow. They're yeah. very low color temperature. They're maybe 2,700 degrees Kelvin. And, and uh, uh, so that can create, <clears throat> create challenges. But a decent hot light that is close to uh, uh, daylight and color temperature um, works great. Yeah. I'll, I'll, uh... I changed my camera setting to incandescent and it made a huge difference, but I like the idea of changing the bulb and uh, I think yeah. I'm gonna try that. Yes, well, you're absolutely right. If you uh, change the camera setting to incandescent, that will help a lot. Yeah. But I like the, uh, uh, you know, uh, being able to shoot something that is uh, close to daylight is probably going to give you the best results, whether it's done with window light or is done with LEDs. Um, you know, you can usually find something that's uh, close to a daylight color temperature. I wanted to point that out too, because when you mentioned LEDs, LEDs can be had anywhere down to like two or three thousand Kelvin and up to eight or nine thousand Kelvin. So it's pretty easy to find something, you know, daylight five or six K. Uh, off the shelf at Lowe's or Home Depot or whatever. And I've been using some LEDs like that in my little light box. Worked pretty well. Yeah, yeah, yep, no, great point, great point. So here's the summary, just, uh, you know, uh, control the direction and quality of light. Um, make sure you're never using direct sunlight. Aim for one shadow. Use a background that complements the subject. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention about backgrounds. I have two graduated backgrounds. I have one that goes from white on one end to black on the other. And then the other one I have goes from gray, light gray on one end to black on the other. And actually 
I, I like that a lot. Um, there's not a whole lot of pictures where I really want a bright white um, background, either in the foreground or, or in the background. So it's nice to have uh, both of them as options. Um, shoot more than one image. Don't shoot one image and think you're done. And then uh, make sure you, you touch them up on the computer because usually there's, even with your best efforts, there's a need to, um, <laughs> there's a need to uh, put some finishing touches on. Okay, sorry, my you probably heard my dog in the background. But so if anybody has any questions, you can just, you can use the space bar to unmute yourself to ask your question, but uh, yeah, you can go ahead and, uh, uh, John, if you could stop sharing, uh, unless you think you need to get back to it. I don't think so right now. Okay. okay. Yeah, so if, uh, uh, Dick, you had had a question. I'll let you ask your question. Just hit the space bar and it'll unmute you. And you yeah, can, uh, uh, John, I'm just interested if you shoot most of your images in raw mode on your DSL camera, or if you use one of the automatic uh, settings more. I, I shoot raw all the time. If I'm using my DSLR, I always shoot raw. I, don't, okay. I never shoot anything at all other than raw. And the reason for that is when you use any one of the compression algorithms, you know, that convert it into JPEG or whatever, um, you, you limit your ability to make fine adjustments, um, especially in uh, products like Lightroom. So I shoot in raw because that enables me to uh, do the best photo editing. Okay, that's what I that's what I thought, but I just wanted to to hear you say it. I guess yeah. <laughs> because yeah. I've had both it, problems in in with JPEG, and I'm still more of a point and shoot guy, even though I have a nice Nikon DSL camera. So I try to do better with RAW, but but I'll I'll try and talk to you when we actually can have meetings because I'm having more issues with fine tuning my, my photos and anything. So I'll, we'll keep it at that. Okay. Yeah, no, I'd be more than happy to talk with you. And uh, I, I can show you, I can I bring my laptop and show you some of the tweaks that I like to make. Thank you. Sure. I have all kinds of questions. Go ahead, Jim. I have all kinds of questions. First off, <laughs> you're really good. You made my day today. I'll tell oh. you, that black velvet, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to keep it clean, but that's got to have some real possibilities. To... You made my day too, because I keep telling him that every single piece that he makes, he should have at least one photograph of. And we've let so many gorgeous pieces out the door without photographing them. I totally agree. And I mean, I like I said, yeah. I can go back to bowl number one. No, oh, man. <laughs> well, well, first, just, well, first just, uh, go back to camera number one. Uh, you don't take anything on automatic. I, well, obviously, if I'm using an iPhone, I, you don't have a lot of controls. Yeah. Um, and I just. Uh, move it in close to the subject and take the picture. But if I'm using my DSLR, I uh, use aperture priority. So yeah, I that, that I, I'll set the uh, f-stop and the camera will select the shutter speed. And actually, if I'm using flash, the flash is the shutter speed, so. When you're trying to get the front and the back of the bowl kind of in focus, do you kind of go to the higher f-stop? Correct. Well, the, the, the higher number yeah. uh, f sub. So F22 will give you the, the greatest depth of field and F2.8 is going to give you the least depth of field. Sometimes yeah. you actually like having a shallow depth of field. Sometimes yeah. it, it enhances the picture. Um, that's a technique called selective focus where you, you actually want part of the image in, in focus and part of the image out of focus. Okay. Also, sometimes when I get all done, you say take 10 or 15 pictures, I take 50 and I scrap them all. And it, that happens often. But uh, when I get something that the color's almost right or I want to enhance it, if I change the film speed, sometimes 
go down to 50 or something. Is that doing sometimes? Well, the, you, right, you're talking, I mean, film speed, you're talking about the ISO. ISO, yeah. Yeah, the, the sensitivity of the sensor. Um, I will generally, it really shouldn't affect the color so much as it affects your ability to use uh, um, a different aperture, you know, to give you a greater or lesser depth of field. So for me, with my camera, I can shoot at ISO 400 and I never worry about image quality. You know, the higher the ISO, the more you degrade the image, right? Yeah, so you don't yeah. want to set it at 6400 or something like that, or your picture's going to look all grainy. Yeah. Um, but well, yeah, I, I think. I even go down to 50 sometimes, and it, it seems to bring it out more, bring out, especially the reds, like in a mahogany or something. That, oh. I don't know. Maybe it's been me. That's cheating. Great. Other questions? So, so John, first of all, congratulations, because if you can do a demo that makes Jim Duxbury's day, you've uh, succeeded. <laughs> you, you, you did it, man. I wish I could do the turning, and that would make my day. <laughs> <laughs> and even yeah, when you get Jim and Rita both doing it, you've you, you, you done well. So, um, But so uh, on the flash that I have, I have the option to change, since I don't have commander mode, you know what I typically do is I'll I can adjust the intensity of the flash from an yes. intensity at one third mode, but I, I guess philosophically you'd want to get the if you're trying to get the whole thing in focus. If I have the opportunity to shoot at f twenty two, that's what I should be. I should use sufficient light with that flash to to try to to maximize. Your flash, up. Steve, is probably powerful enough to if you. Um, uh, put it on full power, you could probably still get a, a, a proper exposure at f22. Right. Um, it, you know, it depends on the power. If you've got a really weak flash, even at full power, you may not be able to use f22. The camera may tell you that too. Well, actually, you know, what, what, if the flash is actually too powerful, I mean, it, I can't operate it more than half power without it just blowing everything out. So. Even, even through the softbox. Yeah, even at f twenty two. Yeah, it. Uh, oh, that's good. That's yeah, good. No, it's it, it's got it's got plenty of power. So, but much I, better I, to have too much power than too little. Right. But my but my thought was there's really no negative. I guess my question is there's no negative in setting that up to run at f twenty two if I'm able to do it. No, and there's I do the selective it, focus. Right. There is no negative whatsoever. Okay. I would say that uh, you know the vast majority of mine. I'm probably. Yeah, between F8, F16, somewhere in that range. Okay. Occasionally F22, if I've got a big bowl and I want to keep uh, it all sharp, then I need something. And and then, at, that, again, without going down a rabbit hole here, but uh, uh, depth of field is controlled by not only the aperture, it's controlled by the distance you are from your subject and by the focal length that you're using. Right. So um, you That's sometimes you can just back away a little bit further from your subject, get the depth of field you need, then do the final cropping in the computer. Okay, good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for John? I got a question, John. Um, so everything, most of what we talked about was in a quite controlled environment, you know, inside. But what if you want to take a picture of your project outside? You know, can you give us a few tips? Like, so sometimes I like to incorporate, like you said, you had chips and popcorn and, you know, maybe fruit or something <laughs> in it. But sometimes you want to incorporate, like today I wanted to incorporate, we have a blooming bush outside and I wanted to incorporate that into the photo. So what kind of tips can you give us for that? Because you're working with the sunlight somewhat directly, but um, you, you know, you have less control, let's say, right? That is a great question, Ted, and thanks for uh, bringing it up. I would, if I'm taking a picture outdoors, I would try to shoot early in the day, very early in the day, or very late in the day. Really, the first two hours of daylight and the last two hours of daylight, 
would be the best. And the reason is, is because the light is softer at those times of day. Um, it's diffused by a lot more atmosphere when <clears throat> you know, you're very late in the day or very early in the day than it is when it's straight overhead. And again, we're trying to achieve that soft, uh, soft light. If you can avoid direct sunlight when you're outdoors and you can shoot in the shade or you can choose an angle that avoids direct sunlight on the subject, you're gonna be a lot happier with the results. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, that's, uh, I'm sorry, I was just going to uh, mention in all the photography teaching that I've done over the years, I tell people if you remember nothing else to get good photographs when you're outdoors, shoot the first two hours a day or the last two hours of the day. If it's high noon, put your camera away and go eat lunch, you know. <laughs> all right. Jim, did you have another question? Um, I just wonder, can you use a reflector in, in outside? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, I do all the time. Again, if you're all you're trying to do with a reflector is bring up the shadow side so that you have detail in the shadows while also having detail in the highlights. You, but you want a little bit differential between those two sides because that's what creates the shape. That's what creates the third dimension. Um, but yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I shoot portraits outside all the time. And, you know, other than my camera, that's what I bring is I bring a reflector. I don't, I don't bring flash or anything else. Hi, this is Terry. Um, great, great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, this is kind of a general, maybe a more general question. Are we going to have access to John's slides? I know he had some specific recommendations for reflectors and backgrounds and stuff in there um, that I would like to see in more detail. Yeah, yeah, we, we're going to post those and I'll work with Bob Edmison to get that on the website. Um, so we'll, it'll be a few days probably before we get it up there, but we will post it out there along with a link uh, for so you can replay this, this uh, uh, session, the Zoom session as well. Great, thanks, Ted. Yep. I got some light stands that came with, with uh, umbrellas that are interlucent umbrella to shoot the light through, and also the silver reflective umbrella. Uh, uh -huh. I think he was talking about bounce light umbrellas. I've I got a couple of those years ago oh. where it's just an umbrella. There's a uh, yeah. Well, there's something called a shoot through umbrella. And then there's a reflective umbrella, and they're exactly yes, what I've they got, say. My, my lights came with both, and uh, I was just wondering if you had a preference. Well, I like the reflective umbrella a little bit better. Um, it just softens the light a little bit more. Um, I mean, they both work, uh, shoot through versus uh, uh, bouncing a light into the umbrella, but if you ask me what my preference is, it would probably be the reflective umbrella. John, I'd just like to reiterate something you said earlier about sources. Uh, I, I went to Southeast, when, after I met with you, I went to Southeast Camera in Carborough and they were, it was incredible what they had for used equipment. And just the, if you go when they're not busy, I, I mean, what a great resource, but um, I mean, it was pennies on the dollar for the yeah. equipment that I got. So it, it definitely, if, uh, it, and, I, and I guess you said what, Peace Camera in Southeast also has, a, has one in Raleigh as well, right? Yeah. Um, but but the one in Carbro, I mean, it, it, it was just, it, what was amazing is that they could actually put their hands on when you go in and ask for something else. I said, oh, okay, it just goes over and pulls something off the shelf. I mean, it was very organized and stuff, but yeah. what a great what a great resource if you want to get into this and maybe not spend so much money. I, I totally agree, Steve. I, um, I have lenses for my Nikon. I have a, you know, a modern DSLI camera, a current Nikon, but it still can take old lenses. It doesn't have all the features of a new lens. You can't, doesn't have autofocus, but I can go buy a, 
old, you know, 50 year old Nikon lens for 50 bucks or something like that. And it still works great. Any, any other questions? You know, in the slides, my concern is um, I have a uh, Nikon P600 point and shoot basically. Uh, you will have something in there saying that we need, we have to have a camera that shoots raw mode. Uh, so I can use that uh, with my wife to get permission to get a new camera. <laughs> if that's what you need, <laughs> LF, yeah, we'll give that to you. <laughs> Whatever it takes. <laughs> Whatever it takes, yeah. Oh, I can't shoot raw, honey. Can't take pictures of any of my work. <laughs> a note from the teacher, right? Yeah, note from your teacher. Uh, so I ended up with a robust lathe, so it works. Um, all right, um, all right, John. I'd like to uh, just just thank you for a great presentation, very informative. Um, as usual, if you have any questions, just uh, just email them to actually to John or myself, and we'll uh, we'll try to get some, you know. We'll, Try to get some questions answered if you need any clarification. Yep. We'll get the presentation on the uh, on the website soon, and uh, we look forward to you know just please try to everybody join on uh, next week for next Thursday for our uh, show and tell. And again, even if it's just a piece you're having trouble with, or you just want to talk about something, a technique or something, it's it is it's it's a great forum to uh, to get some input. So hopefully you all join us then. But you got to get yeah. your pieces in by midnight Wednesday. I, there won't be any late entries next week. Okay. Yep. I just want to add to that. Thanks, John. Uh, excellent. Uh, what you put together here is just wonderful. I mean, for the wood turners, uh, I, I really, uh, really got a lot out of this. And you and I have worked over it before and so forth several times. But uh, going through it again today, I learned, you know, much more so i appreciate that and if you rest of you agree then go down to the reactions and hit that little applaud button down there <laughs> john a hand yeah i don't was, see that I, I where, where is... very good really really appreciate it <laughs>